Okay. Well, good morning and also good evening to our participants online. Uh, welcome you all to today's panel discussion on what the U.S.-China cooperation on artificial intelligence might look like in the future. My name is Nong Hong. I am the Executive Director of the Institute for China American Studies. ICA has been spending almost 10 years researching on many of the key issues affecting the U.S.-China relations that need a greater mutual understanding. Before I hand over the floor to our panels, I just want to say a few words to highlight this critical timing of ICAS hosting this event today. Uh, in in uh, in November last year, um, President Biden and President met in California. The two governments established a new channel for discussion on AI advancement. And April 2nd, during their phone call, the two presidents discussed a range of issues, including advancement in AI as well. And last month, United Nations um, approved a U.S. back resolution with support from about 110 countries, including China. So uh, these uh, non-binding measures encourage members to support responsible and exclusive AI development through domestic regulations and governance. And all this message have clearly sent indication that both countries have strong willingness to push forward for cooperation in the field of AI. Why our panelists will delve into specific on issues what the cooperation may look like, I just want to share with you very briefly an article that I read lately uh, published by the Financial Times. The title is, In One Key AI Match, China Pulls Ahead of the United States Talent. So the message there is, Overall, the United States continue to maintain an uh, absolute global leader. But in terms of the number of researchers on AI um, field, China is not far behind. So the number is suggesting, for instance, all of them in the ranking of the world's top artificial intelligence scientists, all of uh, 100 scientists, 28 have recently worked in China and 42 work in the United States. But I think the either learning uh, and learning in fact, is not where these uh, researchers were, but where they come from. So this article shows the number that researchers originally from China now make up 38% of the top AI uh, research working in the United States, while American make up 37 uh, percentage, according to the research uh, published in these uh, uh, financial times. If we compare three years earlier, those from China make up 27% of top talent working in the United States compared with 31% for the United States. So this data shows how critical that China born researchers are to, uh, to the United States for AI uh, competitiveness. The substantial presence of Chinese AI researchers working in the United States presents a policymaker here with a dilemma. On the one hand, we see increasing measures to counter what they perceive as Chinese espionage. But on the other hand, the policymaker, I have to be very careful that those measures will not hinder the influence of top Chinese computer engineers into the United States, which contribute to the state uh, as a global hub for AI research and development. So I'm going to leave the detailed technical question for our panelists. So we have two distinguished uh, speakers for today's panel discussion. Mr. Paul Trillio is the Associate Partner for China and Technology Policy Lead at Arbeidsdorm Group. And he advises clients in technology, financial service, and other sectors. And Dr. Dennis Summer is a well-known expert on China's business, technology, and innovation strategies. And he's also this Distinguished Fellow at the Institute for China and American Studies. This panel will be moderated by my colleague, Mr. Sarah Gupta, and he is a senior fellow and also head of ICAS Trade and Technology Program. So without further ado, I'm going to give the floor to you, Sarah. Uh, thank you, Nong, and welcome to all. Uh, you know, at this point of time last year, uh, no one was talking of US and China and AI in the same breath. Everybody was talking about a balloon a balloon which had 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 flown or overflown the United States and was shot down. Of course, relations have come a long distance, but that's 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 not the topic of today. We are talking AI today. The point being that even at that point of time when everybody was talking balloons, uh, AI scientists and non-government experts from the two countries were beginning to feel each other out to talk and discuss. AI risks and opportunities in the technology. Uh, not least among them was 
at the age, ripe old age of 100, Henry Kissinger. Henry Kissinger last July was in Beijing discussing AI with Chinese scientists at the age of, of 100. Remember, Kissinger was the person who 70 years ago wrote about his, his one of his first books was titled Nuclear Weapons and Foreign Policy. And, and, and some have likened uh, the, 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 the profoundness of this, of, 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 of AI and how it's going to change the way we live and its impact on national security and military affairs to something as profound as nuclear weapons. Be that as it may, uh, that, that conversation is no longer confined just to AI scientists and non-government experts. It's now become a track one discussion. I believe, I think it was Secretary Raimondo who broached this at some point of time during her visit last August in Beijing that was taken forward thereafter by uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi and National Security Advisor Sullivan. We heard then uh, President Biden and President Xi uh, uh, list it out as well as, as as an important area on which the the two sides need to work together at their summit in Woodside, and 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 we now are waiting for a working group, uh, U.S. China bilateral working group on AI to meet sometime this spring. That working group was initiated at that summit. So obviously, a lot lot has happened in the in the in the one year since the balloon incident, and it's good to see the two sides talk about AI. But there are more questions than answers as to just what are they talking about, who is talking with each other, uh, what, what, where, where is this headed? And so we are very early in this conversation, but it is an important conversation that we need to have. And I think we have some of the best minds on <clears throat> AI out here on this panel, especially Paul. Paul has done tremendous work and thinking through in this area. And so without much any further ado, I'd like to go straight on to Paul for his initial remarks mm. as to where are US and China moving ahead in terms of this working group on AI and what are their goals and objectives and what can be, what, where, where mm. is this headed? Paul, the floor is yours. Thanks, Rabbit and, and Mahang. Uh, great introduction here. Yeah, I mean, this is a, a very salient issue. Wow, China and AI. <laughs> Um, what a hot topic. Um, it seems to be um, on everybody's lips. And yeah, we've come a long way in the last year uh, on this issue. Um, and so I think it's first, you know, maybe useful to start with, you know, a, a short overview of what we mean by AI, because there's a lot contained in that word. Um, and of course, we're talking here primarily about government to government sort of discussions here. Obviously, there's a tremendous amount of other collaboration going on at sort of the, the working level and among engineers and, and researchers and, and companies companies involved in the space, which we, we which we can talk about. But at the government level, uh, you know, how did we get here so that we're talking about this? Um, and I think it's important to just note, you know, what we're talking about here when, when we think about AI. Um, for example, um, the um, you know six years ago we were talking about AlphaGo and and China's national AI development strategy, right? Uh, so it, so AI has been part of the discussion for some time. Um, and, um, you know, and then, we, and then, of course, up until November 2020, uh, 2022, arguably, we were talking about AI uh, widely used in China and, in, and of course, in, in the US for commercial types of, um, of applications. Um, and of course, things like AlphaGo in the, in the science realm. Um, but then in November of, of uh, I guess, 2023, sorry, November 2020, uh, no, no, November 2022. <laughs> I, this is this is the this is the release of ChatGPT. So ChatGPT was released in November of 2022, and then all, and and since then, basically, what we've also been talking about now is 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 a new form of AI called generative AI, um, and things like large language models. So now, when we talk about AI, oftentimes people tend to mean um, generative AI and and applications like ChatGPT. Um, but you know this, and that technology also goes back quite a ways. The first uh, transformer paper was released in 2017. So the industry has been has been talking about generative AI for some time. But in public, the public sort of the discussion around this, and then also the government sort of discussion has really taken off since, um, arguably since November of 2022. In part because this is such a public facing technology, right? AlphaFold is being used to 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 you know to, to analyze proteins, but that's sort of taking place in the scientific community. But but with with the release of ChatGPT, all of a sudden people were 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 
face to face with an AI capability. Um, and that really changed uh, the equation uh, quite a bit. Um, and so I think um, th that it's important to note that, that, that in the last year then, because of the release of ChatGPT and generative AI, we've had a couple of um, major developments. One is this focus on national security and the potential for, for, um, uh, for these large language models to, to have a national security impact. And then also a sense that given this is such now an important emerging technology that, there's, that whoever leads in this arena is gonna have a major economic advantage um, uh, and so what, whichever countries sort of dominate, companies and countries dominate um, this will, will sort of, you know, will, will have this lead in economic growth. But, but on the national security side, I think, you know, that's where the governments have come in over the past year. So suddenly governments saw the potential for these things to be used for more nefarious purposes, disinformation, deep fakes, enhanced cyber operations, and things like better designs for biological, chemical, or nuclear weapons. Um, and that's that was the focus, for example, of the U.S. Uh, executive order in November uh, that came out just before an um, uh, international uh, uh, safety summit in the U.K. So, but that doesn't mean that these other concerns weren't there, right? Before this, we were talking about bias and copyright issues um, and, and all these other things. But now the sort of national security issues have become, um, uh, uh, you know, sort of front and center. Now, we also had the EU. Of course, the EU uh, has been ongoing and trying to regulate AI for a long time. Um, and so the, the, the EU AI Act had to, sort of, had to sort of pivot there and also include generative AI um, over the last year. And, uh, and again, a lot of that, the, the, the EU sort of regulatory issues around AI are focused more on consumer rights, um, and avoiding damage to, to data privacy um, and bias things like biased decision making, but they had to make had to make a really serious effort, and it's, it's really a good example of a serious regulatory effort to regulate AI, AI that started well before um, you know generative AI and ChatGPT. Um, so the U.S. response over the last year is important to note to, to, to understand how we got here. Um, the White House really geared up, really arguably late in 2022, with a, an AI Bill of Rights, um, and then last year we had the White House Voluntary Commitments. Which, which had two tranches, you know, two, uh, two uh, different uh, uh, periods where big AI companies signed up to this. So the, the, all the leaders, for example, OpenAI, Anthropic, all signed up to the original one. Then it was expanded later in the year. Uh, and there's also foreign companies involved, companies like Stability AI signed up in the UK and Cohere in, in Canada. So that was a big, that was a big deal. That was, um, those, those commitments are fairly uncontroversial, but it was still important for, for those um, for those companies to sign up to that. And then we also had, as I noted, noted the, the AI uh, executive order, which was a massive document, which, which we're still plowing through and re released in late October. Um, and again, heavy, heavy national security focus there, um, trying to uh, have companies, for example, cloud providers provide data on, on which companies are training AI in the cloud at a certain technology thre uh, threshold. Um, and then, um, uh, we also had the sort of culminating in the UK AI summit, but I think it's important to understand that as we look at US China uh, in Bletchley Park in uh, in November, um, that was a big deal, and China also participated in that along with the US. But there was a lot of a lot of churn around that before about who would participate and whether China would participate. Um, and then on the Chinese side, of course, we also had a similar sort of uh, process. We had um, a, a quick gearing up of regulate regulation around generative AI. The Cyberspace Administration of China put out draft regulations in April and then backed off a little bit uh, in the final version of those regulations. They eased up on some things like um, like give, giving companies time to fix. Uh, problems um, in in how how the, the how chatbots responded to make sure that there were no criticisms of Mao or or Xi Jinping that that, that would that would come out of there. So, you know that was a big deal. And then the, the, their standards bodies in China have been working around things like watermarking AI content. Um, and then finally, CAC licensed a whole lot of large language models starting in August. Um, issued sort of formal licenses. They just actually issued the first. More, more, more public uh, version of the list of AI models. Um, a couple, of, uh, I think it was actually last week. Um, and so the Chinese government has been has, has been you know, thinking about regulation uh, for some time, and uh, that really sort of took hold in, in 2023. Um, and so then again, China then was finally participated in the in the meetings in uh, in the UK uh, in November um, via um, both uh, the government level with the vice minister from the Ministry of Science and Technology, and then leading companies like Baidu and Tencent and Alibaba sent fairly junior people there. I think it's important to note compared to um, the Western leading Western AI companies, which all sent their leading their CEOs like Sam Altman, of course, and, uh, and, and these CEOs from all, all the companies that, that participated was very senior representation. And then as Surab noted, 
We also last year had these these the sort of emergence of a lot of track two dialogues um, on AI. Um, yeah, Henry Kissinger um, was was apparently flown into China by on, on Eric Schmidt's uh, private plane. Um, you know, hundred years old. Amazing that he that he did this, but he 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 was seized. Um, with the, the issue of AI uh, and saw it as an, you know one of those things that that he that he he hoped and wished before um, uh, before he passed away that 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 um, that the U.S. and China could figure out a way to, co to 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 cooperate on. And just to give you a sort of personal anecdote, I was in China in September um, before some of the before the Buxley Park uh, uh, event, and I was at, I was uh, standing outside of a of a of a building uh, just outside the Chinese leadership compound, Zhongnanhai in Beijing, talking with. Um, uh, with the uh, former economic czar Liu Ha, we were meeting there with some some U.S. CEOs, and all of a sudden, I found myself in a conversation about AI with uh, Liu Ha, who's who's you know not a noted AI expert, but you know he that he was he had been uh, you know aware of things like the Kissinger Initiative and other things, and so he was very much uh, uh, involved in that. And then we also saw really the as Sir also noted the, the groups of of U.S. Um, and not just U.S., but also Canadian AI researchers and leading leading lights in the field like Yashio Bengio and um, and Jeff Hinton also participating in in, in sort of unofficial uh, dialogues with with the Chinese AI leading Ch Chinese AI researchers um, on several occasions last year um, in an attempt to sort of discuss and, and and engage on these tough issues around you know what what where do we go and. Uh, in the future, and how do we think about AI? And of course, we had uh, some Chinese scientists sign on to the, these the, this, these letters that came out last year about the existential mm -hmm. risk um, of artificial intelligence. So, so last year was a very, a very, um, a very, a very rich year in terms of this. So, as we get to the, um, to the to to how we think about where U.S. and China might collaborate here, I think it's also important to note that in addition to those events over the last year, we had a couple of other big memes take hold. <laughs> Um, begin to take hold in DC. One, one, the first meme was that the U.S. and China are competing in AI in a sort of arms race, right? Um, and this, 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 this meme has taken firm hold in DC. And so the other issue is that that's helped drive this issue uh, and, and the complexities around it. The Biden administration um, in late in, in 2022 began to seek novel ways to slow China's AI rise by identifying and controlling technology choke points. And so, of course. Uh, in October of 2022, and then later updated in October 23, we had you know very serious restrictions placed on GPUs, graphical processing units, which are sort of a, a hardware base uh, for developing and training uh, AI algorithms, and particularly large language models. Um, and so the, the Commerce Department wrote these rules around performance levels, attempting to limit Chinese company access to the most advanced hardware. Uh, and then finally, Secretary Raimondo in, in December uh, finally said... <laughs> That the goal of the controls, this is the first time she'd articulated this, was to prevent China from training frontier, so-called frontier models. Now, these are frontier models. Usually, the term as it's used in the West means, you know, sort of advanced chatbots beyond GPT-4. Even ChatGPT-5 Chat would be considered a, a frontier model. Um, so, what's going on here? Um, even before ChatGPT and GenAI had burst on the scene, U.S. officials were concerned about the potential for for military use of advanced GPUs, uh, primarily as, for example, as accelerators in high-performance computers. Um, a small subset of which, of course, are used, to, in fact, to design weapons systems, um, things like hypersonic missiles. Um, and so so AI had been had been uh, had, you know, had been on the radar before. But it's very interesting that that um, that um, that Secretary Romando specifically talked about frontier models, which are not being used, as far as I can tell, by any military for mission critical operations, because they're still they're still sort of in an early stage of development. And so so it's hard to argue that that um, that frontier models have a military end use at this point yet. I mean, obviously, they could in the future. So Romano's message morphed, you know, from the controls on around October in October of 2022. Um, to into this this focus on frontier models, and I think that's really important to understand in terms of as we think of U.S. China talking about this issue. So we fast forward to now, you know, where where are we coming out of the Bletchley Park process? Um, there was a growing consensus that China and Chinese companies had to be included in global discussions around how to regulate uh, and 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 develop a framework around regulating uh, 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 frontier models. And so, you know, otherwise there'd be no, no uh, you know, no ability to get a global agreement. So we have, if we look at the global landscape, U.S. is obviously first and foremost the leader in AI, um, considerably ahead of China in some areas. 
Joe Tsai from Alibaba argued uh, last week that, that China was two years behind. I think that might, we can argue whether that's true or not. Um, but China's clearly second, but then there's a huge drop off to third, right? Um, Canada and the UK and Israel have, have robust AI capabilities, but in terms of scale, um, and number of companies, and number of researchers, and number of STEM re STEM researchers. Um, you know, it's really the U.S. and China. So China, the, the consensus is that China and Chinese companies need to be part of of a global dialogue. But the question is how to do this, and also for China, what's in it for China? Um, so. The, the, and the complexities, for example, around who speaks for China on this is really part of part of the, the uh, really complex issue as we look at how the U.S. and China can talk about this, because it depends on what you're talking about, um, what issue you're talking about, who should represent each side, for example. So um, the possible discussion topics that come to mind um, are, like, for example, military use of AI. Um, and there was a lot of discussion around this before the the the, the meeting be between Presidents Biden and Xi in September, um, that there might be some agreement on nuclear command and control and use of AI nuclear command and control. Those stories proved to be false. Um, and again, I think the problem is that that would involve a very serious negotiation that involved the Chinese military, right? If you're talking about things like nuclear command and control. Um, so this is a complicated issue. Some of the track two, so there's, there's a Brookings track two, track two that has, has for the last two years that have, has tackled and discussed things like um, the use of AI and, and nuclear command and control. So it's possible that that could be a topic um, on the agenda, but it's not it's not clear that China is ready to, to you know, to seriously negotiate on this. Um, and there's a lot of other negotiations around military use of AI, for example, um, in uh, lethal autonomous weapons systems that, that have been going on for some time at the UN. And that's a whole nother, another issue. Um, then there's the issue of disinformation. That's been mooted as a possible topic of discussion. This issue, you know, has really not become, although, you know, as salient in China as it has become in the U.S., there's a lot of concern in the U.S. about disinformation around elections, um, and and so so this is this is but this is a tricky issue because the CAC regulation, for example, of large language models um, was very much focused on uh, on content. It was focused on deep fakes, uh, and 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 so it's it's that the Chinese government has been thinking about this for some time. Um, but you know, but this is more an issue around censorship of the of of, of information rather than sort of disinformation. So it's, it's a possible they could talk about this topic, but um, it's not clear again who would do that on the Chinese side. For example, CAC is is a as a, as a party and government organization would probably not be uh, authorized to talk about um, disinformation and regulation uh, of that issue around AI um, in, in a bilateral negotiation with the US. Then there's then there's a question of actually regulating frontier models, because that's sort of what the global where the global discussion is, right? The next meeting, for example, of the Bletchley Park process will be in Seoul. It'll probably be a virtual meeting. Um, and, and there's a lot of churn on that issue. But that and that's where the sort of the global the global debate is. And China's part of that too. And so China, anything that happens bilaterally will have to somehow, you know, at least align with what China is considering doing um, uh, in, these multi, in this multilateral forum. But it's complicated here because then you right away get into the GPU problem, right? Um, and, the, and also cloud, the cloud issue, because part of the Biden executive order, for example, was this requirement that companies, that U.S. cloud providers report to the U.S. government on companies that are using their cloud to, to, to train a uh, large language models at a very high threshold really they are really we're talking frontier AI, AI models um but this is a this is a big problem uh, and it comes out of also a broader KYC issue you know your client issue um that the administration has been concerned about a long time around cybersecurity so so the cybersecurity and AI have sort of come together um here um but again um it's tricky to see how that the, the Chinese government is going to agree to discuss regulating frontier AI models when at the same time that the U.S. Commerce Department is undercutting the ability of Chinese companies to train those very models, um, and so that's a that's a really a really tough issue. So as we think about what the what what again how what what they're going to talk about, I think it's um, it's a it, it, the, the the issues are twofold. One is who's going to talk, what's the topic, um, and then who's going to be authorized to have to to to, uh, to to talk on behalf of either side. The U.S. government has the same problem. A lot of the U.S. AI policy, for example, is driven from the White House um, and, and increasingly from the Commerce Department. But there's no one organization that owns the issue, for example, of, uh, of regulating frontier AI models. There's been a lot of discussion within the administration. Is a new organization needed, for example, specifically to focus on, on uh, regulation of frontier AI models? 
Um, and then finally, you know, there's there's a lot of discussion around sa AI safety institutes. So coming out of the Bletchley Park process, the UK and the, and, the, and the US have set up AI safety institutes and they're collaborating that. And so that could be an area, for example, where, you know, a, a Chinese uh, a sort of non-government organization that's, that's looking at AI safety could potentially be part of this. But the problem there is that those safety institutes are going to be training or are going to be testing um, large language models from the big companies. At Bletchley Park, the Chinese delegation was excluded from the, the last part of the of the of the um, of the conference. Uh, Chinese companies and, and the Chinese government were excluded. And that's that's where US companies like OpenAI and Anthropic and Inflection, all the big players agreed to allow their models to be tested by these these safety institutes in the UK, uh, in the US and in Singapore. And so uh, that's a potential area where, you know, arguably you would want China to do that, but then that would require the Chinese government, of course, to allow its companies to allow their advanced models to be tested by by uh, safety organizations in other countries, right? And that's a, that's a, that's a really tough uh, issue, a political issue. And again, I'm not sure how to overcome that um, because I think the Chinese government and Chinese companies haven't figured out, you know, whether that's that's okay. But that's where that's where the the global discussion right now is on how do you test and somehow evaluate these large language models for risks. Um, and the question is sort of how to how to integrate China and Chinese companies into that process. That's where we are now. So the bilateral discussion has to again sort of account for the fact that that China hasn't really figured out how to do that. Uh, the Chinese government, um, uh, and then you know, at, at a bilateral level, then how do you discuss this when both sides are still trying to figure out um, how do you how do you regulate things like frontier AI models, which could be uh, uh, you know, one of the topics on the agenda. So let me stop there, and and uh, and I'm happy to address and, and go into the detail on the, these issues as we go forward and with the discussion. Oh, thanks, Paul. That was terrific. Great table setup. Brought us completely up to speed and also the dilemmas of how exactly to structure the conversation between the two sides. Just fascinating on both who speaks and also on the various issues, whether they can really transact or even engage each other. Fascinating. Our next speaker is uh, Dennis Simon. Uh, Dennis is a, a distinguished fellow at the Institute at ICAS. Uh, Dennis is going to give his broad observations on US, China, and AI, but he's also going to delve a little bit into where are the Chinese coming from at the, on AI? What are their interests? What are they seeking out of this conversation? Uh, Dennis, the floor is yours. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much. And uh, as you started off, and as Paul showed quite clearly, there are more questions than there are answers uh, about this. And uh, I think uh, uh, both sides are trying to figure out where they're going to end up. Uh, I was in China in uh, late February, early March, and I had just uh, been in Washington right before that and met with some Chinese uh, embassy people. And I can tell you, uh, the discussion really is also a lot about the shifting frameworks of US-China relations. If you think about where we were when the first uh, S&T agreement was signed in 1979, we had a period of 30 plus years uh, when uh, the numbers of protocols went from a few to over 40. And uh, in the usual parlance, uh, AI would just be another field that we uh, uh, engaged in. And most of my Chinese friends during these visits, they kept asking me the same question what kind of AI cooperation does the United States have uh, aimed primarily at the development of AI, the joint development of AI, just as if uh, uh, they were going to take on another science and technology project area and there would be a multifaceted collaboration to push the uh, development of this technology into the future. And I kind of slowed them down and I said, you know, I think the U.S. perspective is somewhat different about this uh, working group and what's going to happen. I think they really want to discuss more about the management of AI and more about, in fact, to be very honest, the control over AI. Uh, America has a certain perspective on uh, the potential nefarious uses of AI, and uh, not to say that China would necessarily engage in those, but uh, you need to be uh, you know, aware that uh, when you sit down, whether it's in Beijing or it's going to be in uh, the United States, that the discussion is not going to be about joint development among scientists. It's mostly going to be among policymakers who basically are going to come to hopefully some agreement about the limits to the uses of AI, uh, particularly in the military area. 
Well, they took a deep breath when they heard that because that's not what they really want to discuss. Um, uh, and and uh, I can tell you, they are very aware of the dangers. Uh, uh, people in the science and technology community in China are very aware of these dangers. But the reality is that under this new uh, situation where China is an existential threat to the United States, it's not only the technology that's at issue, but it's the norms and values attached to the application of the technology that has the U.S. Uh, having some degree of heartburn about what could happen or might happen in the years ahead. But you have to understand, uh, Chinese officials are just as concerned, particularly internally, uh, how uh, AI could be used in a uh, nefarious way. And of course, they are concerned uh, uh, in, in, the, in world affairs, how uh, China could be uh, the object of the use of some of these technologies also to impose some controls on the Chinese. So um, I think that the, if we really want to understand all of this, we, we have to understand that we are in the midst of these shifting frameworks uh, from China as a stable, modernizing country being good for the United States and China uh, to a point where now China is this existential threat to the well-being and future prosperity of, of the United States. Now, last month, uh, we know that the Liang Hui, the so-called two sessions meetings, was held in Beijing. And uh, uh, we know that this is a, sort of a meeting to reaffirm uh, the goals and policies that uh, Xi Jinping uh, had uh, laid out. Um, one of the most important aspects of this uh, was this new emphasis on the so-called new productive forces. Uh, the new productive forces are those forces that will be driving uh, the global economy. Uh, they have been fostered by the acceleration of technological advance and more rapid innovation systems. And China is extremely cognizant, uh, particularly in these frontier areas, that it must uh, keep a pace. And I want to you know, just highlight last Wednesday in the People's Daily, uh, there was a very, very interesting interview with uh, Jin Zhuanglong. Uh, he is the uh, uh, minister in charge of MIIT. Uh, and he laid out a whole framework for what uh, the Chinese are now calling AI-led uh, uh, transformation of their economy. Um, and uh, this is, uh, you might call it Xi Jinping's big bet. Uh, it's the big bet that uh, he can get China out of the doldrums uh, and uh, into a whole new economic and technological posture uh, by using this kind of model of, uh, of uh, AI-led uh, uh, transformation. Now, I think uh, uh, new productive forces is a very, very important part of this. Uh, uh, we know that the Chinese innovation system is not the kind of laggard that it was a few years ago. Uh, and, and you may remember there were many articles being written, can China innovate or why China can't innovate? Well, we, we're not thinking about that anymore. And uh, I would just commend you. I, I got a chance on YouTube the other day to watch a uh, video of the new car, uh, electric car produced by Xiaomi. Uh, I think it's the X7. And um, that is one impressive vehicle. Now, whether the Chinese benchmarked every car out there or whether they came up with their own designs, the, the vehicle is an impressive car. It demonstrates China's ability at systems integration, uh, at innovation, and uh, also to do this at reasonable cost. Uh, according to the uh, at least that, that video, that car is going to sell for 42,000 US dollars. Clearly a price point that would be very attractive to many Americans if that car ever makes its way into the United States. Um, but so China has moved in the World uh, Innovation Index. Uh, it was number 34 in 2012. Uh, and in 2023, it reached the 12th position. Uh, and uh, uh, the GII is something put out by WIPO. Uh, it's a fairly re reliable and uh, high integrity um, uh, assessment of technological capabilities. And it basically is attesting to the fact that China now has gone from being a manufacturing powerhouse uh, to a country where the digital economy is growing very, ra very rapidly and industrial informatization is growing very, very rapidly. And all of these
these are going to be aided and abetted by this new uh, uh, economy driven by artificial intelligence. Uh, Xi Jinping uh, at the Lianhui uh, made this statement. He said, uh, China must adapt and lead the new round of the S&T revolution and industrial transformation. And he was followed by Li Chang, who said then, we must accelerate the improvement of our industrial innovation capability so China can move from a tech follower to an innovation pace setter. So this is a it is very clearly laid out. Uh, and, and I would just uh, note, just for the record, um, if you were to track Chinese statements since 1978 by leaders about China's technological goals and ambitions, uh, you could actually get a pretty good picture of where they were headed in the 80s and 90s, uh, what they were doing at the turn of the century, and where they are right now. There is no secret uh, plan. There is no conspiratorial uh, effort. Uh, these are all fairly clearly laid out in the policy documents that come out of these meetings, out of uh, uh, President Xi's various speeches, et cetera, et cetera. Now, why is this push for new productive forces so important? And here I want to quote uh, uh, last month, at, at the end of the month, The Economist had a very, very interesting article about the emergence of these new productive forces. And one of their uh, reporters said, prioritizing the new productive forces on the agenda of Chinese leaders uh, reflects their anxiety over China potentially lagging behind the U.S. in cutting-edge technologies such as advanced chips and artificial intelligence. So you can be sure China is listening with both ears. It's listening on the one hand to the control management side that Paul was talking very much about, but they're also listening to where is the technology headed and uh, where is China going to be as that technology evolves into the future. So I want to kind of highlight for just a few minutes uh, just what China is thinking in terms of this new innovation model that they are putting in place. And don't forget, this new innovation model, as the Chinese see it, is part of the so-called fourth industrial revolution. Remember, China missed basically the first industrial revolution from the Western incursions in the 19th century. They pretty much uh, missed the electronics and inform information revolutions because of the culture revolution. And now here we are in this fourth industrial revolution led by technologies like AI, biotech and life sciences, uh, et cetera, and, qu and quantum computing. So um, it's very clear that China now has become a highly complex, uh, very rapidly changing techno-industrial society. It's no longer the backward poor China that it was. And thus the asymmetries that separated the United States and China for much of that 30 years have largely disappeared. Uh, while we're not exactly as at parity as Paul indicated, we are close to parity in a number of areas. And uh, in fact, in some areas, China may be the leader. So China is taking this very seriously, um, and uh, they are pushing ahead. Uh, last year, R&D spending uh, grew about uh, a little over 8%, uh, but we just heard at the Lianhui and the uh, uh, plan documents that have come out, it's to grow about 10% this year. Uh, a basic research grew a, not, a little over 9% last year. It's also designed to grow at a much faster rate. And the reason for this is that, uh, uh, as Paul suggested, AI and related technologies are all part of what are called now core technologies, sometimes called bottleneck technologies, and when they're really pushed for, called choke point technologies all of which are uh, the U.S. basically has engineered these new controls uh, and China sees them as highly disruptive uh, in terms of its future science and technology development. And I think that the, the reason for this article in the People's Daily and uh, the interview with the media, uh, MIIT minister is to lay out what China intends to do into the future uh, and uh, why it is in fact directing all of this attention. So um, we've heard about the the three new technologies uh, that uh, uh, were being discussed by Janet Yellen and uh, uh, her Chinese counterpart, uh, Mr. Wang from the Commerce Ministry, um, uh, those are the so-called uh, three advantage technologies that China has, electric vehicles, lithium-ion batteries, and photovoltaic technologies. 
But uh, if you go back, there's a list of about 35 key core technologies that the Chinese uh, uh, have laid out. It was actually presented publicly in the Kaji Rabao, the S&T Daily. Uh, and uh, those, of course, include AI, quantum computing, big data, and space. Uh, and uh, space, I will tell you, is a very, very interesting area as we look forward uh, in, in the coming years. The other thing is that the uh, Chinese leaders are talking about something called national S&T uh, strategic forces. Uh, and these are taking the top enterprises, the top research institutes and universities, uh, and uh, the best national labs uh, and uh, mobilizing them in what uh, uh, in, in Chinese uh, uh, is translated into this whole of nation approach, Jubo uh, teacher. And uh, this is also quite, quite important. So um, I think the, the interesting uh, conclusion that one comes when they, when they look at this is that, uh, as I said, not only is this serious, but there's money. Uh, in, in The Economist, actually this morning, uh, uh, there was an article about these new productive forces, uh, and they estimate that China now is investing 1.6 trillion US dollars uh, in investment double what they were investing in these new emerging technologies uh, just uh, five years ago. Uh, and that uh, almost 43 percent, I think they say, of all new business investment uh, is going into these areas, uh, which includes AI. So this is, uh, again, there's no doubt the, the big bet. Uh, and uh, uh, it's going to be very interesting. But I, I just want to remind everyone as Xi Jinping continues to talk about increased self-reliance and increased self-sufficiency in response to what the U.S. has been doing and uh, these new constraints, uh, she has also continued to retain a strong commitment uh, to international engagement. Um, we see this in the field of education with his 50,000 student uh, initiative that he announced in, in San Francisco in November. We see it in uh, something very interesting uh, that was announced last year at the Jung Guan Swin Forum, which I was lucky to attend. Um, at that meeting, uh, Vice, uh, Vice Premier Ding, who has the S&P portfolio, uh, talked about the establishment of three major talent hubs. Uh, in China, all designed to attract international talent. So this is not the Thousand Talent Program. This is something very, very different. Um, and China is taking a page out of the U.S. playbook. They're seeing that if these uh, uh, the arrival of this talent in the U.S. has been critical to the advance of U.S. science and technology, that China, too, could benefit from the increased presence of foreigners in their R&D system. And it will be interesting to see, in fact, if they can succeed in attracting these. But uh, Beijing, Shanghai, and Shenzhen. And uh, uh, just to quote to Xi Jinping, he says, the competition in comprehensive national power in the final analysis is a competition for talent. Talent is an important indicator for measuring a country's comprehensive power. So uh, China is all about technology, all about innovation, and all about talent. And I would say that we must nest whatever Paul's you know, uh, talking about within the context of these kind of imperatives that are driving China in order to understand where China is going to be headed in the future. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. That was terrific. I, what we sometimes forget is that, you know, China is just a $12,000 per capita economy at this point of time. Uh, it really is a tech overachiever, even though because it's always paired with the U.S., like it's always a, looked at as, as a follower. But in terms of where it is in its own development, it's a huge tech overachiever. But fascinating and how focused they are on getting it right or, or succeeding in this area, or at least not missing the train. Let's get to discussion. Let's get to Q and A. Uh, let me pepper both of you with some short, short questions. Uh, Paul, can I come to you? This is just a very conceptual question. You know, we are bombarded with this concept of you know AI and it's moving in leaps and bounds. The technology, especially with uh, following that L the LLMs and all those things. You know, we have Moore's law. It's related with regard to computing, with regard to integrated circuits. We've, we've kind of seen that development and evolution right from the 1960s onwards and how quickly it has evolved. If 
where integrated circuits was in 1960 and today where, where chips are in, in 2024, where would you place development where AI is in, I mean, we think like we're going to be bowled over tomorrow by AI or we already are. Where are we really in this in the context of AI's larger development and its impact on the way we live and in industrial processes? Wow, that's a we could do a whole show just on that too. That's, that's right. A, that's that's a that's a that's a really good question. I think we're sort of I think we're sort of in the early innings. I mean, I was in um, in California last month, uh, deep in the heart of Silicon Valley at the Nvidia conference uh, that they hold every year. It was the first time I'd done face to face since the pandemic. Um, and it was, the, guess what the theme was this year? It was AI. So it was wall to wall um, panels about AI um, and deep techn techn technology related panels, um, some regulatory and government panels, but um, mostly the technology. And every company in the world <laughs> that uh, of any you know note in in, the, in this area was there, right? And Nvidia obviously is the is the leader globally in um, in developing the hardware to, to really is driving the current sort of AI um, revolution. Uh, and Nvidia and Jason J Jensen Huang unveiled this this amazing new uh, system, the Blackwell uh, GPU based system, which is which is is going to become the standard for training these large language models. But I think I was just, I was bowled over by sort of the, the range of, um, of applications that were under discussion. Things that people don't think about like digital twins were, which are really, really important. You can sort of model whole industrial facilities using uh, an AI approach in the cloud um, before you even build the facility, right? And so, so that's, there, there are applications like that, which which Jensen sort of highlighted as sort of a real focus, for example, of Nvidia, um, that are they're already having a huge impact, saving saving money and costs, right? So there are a lot of things that are mm -hmm. happening that are they're not like ChatGPT getting better <laughs> at, at at answering questions and not hallucinating. There's a lot of really really practical sort of applications within industry that are happening um, at a, at a, a breakneck speed. I mean, you can put an AI system to recognize faults, for example, in manufacturing and manufacturing process. So in the semiconductor industry, which is really cost conscious and always trying to reduce the amount of, of, of defects, you can use that, you can put you can use generative AI as a sort of front end to that, that system. And you couple that with you know image recognition and 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 processing. And you can you can reduce pretty quickly, for example, the the rate, the fault rate and, and analyze things. And people who don't have an expertise um, you know, necessarily can use a generative AI front end to that, for example, to, to query a system and get and analyze what's going on. So there's a lot of stuff like that going on. And again, I think we're sort of in the first the first inning on that because those the hardware, as you noted, I mean, the, the, the fact that we can now train these models at, at scale and, and with lots of data and we're getting into multimodal models that are going to include language and, and images, of course, and video. Um, is we're sort of just getting in, getting getting there, and then the conference was very much focused on practical issues. The bigger issue of sort of artificial general intelligence and or what I prefer to call advanced machine intelligence is is still sort of you know people aren't really talking about that. People are talking about very very specific kinds of applications where you couple generative AI with other other AI applications or other capabilities to produce a system that has a really you know, practical impact on on an industrial process or you know within enterprises. The big the big money here, of course, is going to be on enterprises, and 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 that's where, for example, in China, when I'm I'm going to put a paper out hopefully next week on an update on where China's generative AI companies are on all this, right? And a lot of the focus in China, as Dennis mentioned, the Chinese government views AI as this critical sort of force multiplier going forward that will help its industries improve, et cetera, et cetera. So the the focus in China. Is not so much on chat agents as we, we focus a lot on it here, but it's on B two B business to business applications, enterprise applications. So companies like Baidu, for example, are are have are, are actually generating revenue for the first time in their last quarterly <laughs> report. They claimed they claimed revenue generated from this B two B use of AI. So enterprises are licensing their uh, Ernie Bot large language model, for example, and using that internally to increase productivity. Right? There's lots of different ways to do that. Um, and so we're sort of in the first innings of that process happening. OpenAI and, uh, you know, really big U.S. companies like OpenAI and Cohere in Canada are also very much focused on the on the B2B market, right? Even though OpenAI is driving the chatbot 
uh, revolution and 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 uh, and ChatGPT, they're actually generating revenue is from licensing the, the the their models and then working with companies to leverage their internal data to train those models to generate you know productivity gains and 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 understand um, uh, you know their their business processes and using AI to sort of improve those. Uh, but that but th those are still again sort of um, th those have been going on with other AI applications for a long time. But generative AI gives you this new ability to have a front end and access to this in a sort of human, you know, conversational way that, that wasn't really possible before. But when you, the power of this though, is that when you lash together generative AI with other applications within a company, you get, you get real benefits. But again, it's still early stages there. Um, and then the, 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 the a, a lot of effort is going into, um, you know, the hardware development and national compute. We didn't talk about that, but uh, as Dennis noted, as part of that process of the new productive forces, for example, and this is happening in other countries, there's also an effort by governments to support developing national compute to make this, this capability to train models available to a broader set of, of, of actors. Because, you know, it, right now it's kind of, it's very expensive, for example, to train a large language model. It costs $100 million to train ChatGPT, right? right? Um, taxi 3.5. Um, and so only a few companies, the big companies can can play at that level. Uh, and so there's, a, there's also a big movement to sort of democratize access to compute um, by putting in place national compute. So in China, you have the National Unified Computing Power Network, which is a huge national project to make national compute available to for research and for other things um that, that and and sort of democratize if you will uh the, the the technology and we're still at the very early stages there too the us is going to do a similar thing canada has a has a uh, and india also have uh, projects to have national compute so uh, you know the the, the 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 challenge here though is at some point that you know you have you do have to make money so you have the infrastructure build out the compute infrastructure then you have the development of of, of large language models um, and then you have the development of applications. Those are three different distinctive areas. And, you know, the infrastructure is very well developed and, and, and getting better and better. The, the model development is still arguably in some early stages. And there's some obviously a lot of progress there and a lot of effort going on. I was blown away by the, at the conference in, in terms of all the different things people are thinking about for like ChatGPT7 and, and beyond. Um, and then the application is where, you know, that you still have to generate revenue that you can then plow back into that infrastructure piece and into the development of those models. And so we're sort of in China, we're sort of in, a, in, in an interesting cycle where Chinese companies are doing are, are starting to get some traction, but they're still not generating you know huge amounts of revenue that then will allow them to sort of train, you know, buy the next generation of hardware and then train that. And that's, of course, where U.S. controls come in. Uh, and that's where Xi Jinping and, and where Dennis's points are really valid, because the Chinese government sees these this that kind of development cycle as critical to economic growth in the future and so in fact during the biden c phone call last month president c put the sort of technology controls on par in china with taiwan yes. uh, with concern about taiwan and the important point there is that china and she now see this issue taiwan is sort of a future issue they think that so far the u.s is managing that issue pretty well with china but this is the tech controls are an immediate issue. It's right now. It's it's not a future theoretical thing. It's something right now that threatens, in Xi's view, the the future development of China economically and scientifically, right? And so he's he he came to the San Francisco meeting, for example, in uh, the bilateral meeting uh, in November, sort of loaded for bear, and he was very very vis visibly upset and, and when he was talking about these these technology controls and he also he did this, he, he was very he, similar raised them in, 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 during the, the last phone call um so so it's it's and he was very well versed by the way on all the details of us export controls um people were surprised uh, president biden actually was you know is probably not as well versed, for example, as Xi Jinping on these, because it's obviously it's become a huge issue, as Dennis, as Dennis pointed out. Um, and the new productive forces, you know, are also very, very much include things like semiconductors and 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 AI and hard hard and core technologies. So this is this brings that back into the U.S.-China relationship very viscerally, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of how you, if you're going to have a dialogue, how do you overcome that issue? Because that's a very tough issue um, to see progress on you know the us is not going to roll back some of those export controls um there will probably be new export controls coming coming in the couple in the coming weeks that will make the that will really complicate the relationship because china will react will retaliate will go after us companies will control critical minerals and other inputs um to to various key uh, uh um you know technology supply chains 
And so, you know, we're, we're the, the the AI issue is really front and center in the relationship because of all this other collateral uh, issues around it. And so that's going to complicate this effort to get the, to bring it back to the original, you know, working AI working group. It's going to have to tackle it. it, it these can't be ignored. And mm -hmm. I think the Chinese side has raised this issue over the last year. It's amazing how quickly the, the, the two that final, I'll just say two things that it's quick, amazing how quickly the, the meme that AI is and, and China are part of this existential threat that Dennis mentioned, that's gone pretty quickly from zero to 60 in the last year and a half, two years. And then the other p issue is how the Chinese side has gone quickly to, to really be um, you know, concerned about uh, the, the extent of the U.S. technology controls and what they mean for China um, and China's economy going forward. Dennis, please go ahead. I, I just was going to make a simple point since we're talking about uh, science and technology. One of the biggest areas that the Chinese find for AI is the use in R&D. Uh, you know that uh, for every, like say in the big far in pharmaceuticals, you can explore, you know, ten projects for every one that succeeds and spend not just millions but billions of dollars. But if you could use AI to identify productive pathways in research, you could circumvent a whole uh, amount of money to be spent and time to be spent uh, and get more quickly to some kind of desired solution. And if you're in the game of catch up. Uh, you can basically then short, uh, uh, shorten the, the time that you get to a result uh, and, and a, a useful commercially viable result. Uh, you could uh, really speed up uh, the R&D to commercialization process very, very quickly. So this is I heard a number of people when I was in Beijing uh, talking about this particular uh, application as being one of great, great importance. Let me get to the Q&As. Let me just club two questions together. Um, and this is about the cooperative aspect of US and China. One is, can can the two of them in any way cooperate and play a, a, on AI in, in global South countries? You know, like they're talking, US and China have a working group where they're talking about debt distress, et cetera, et cetera. Is there any area or scope where the two can cooperate in, 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 in developing countries? And let me pair that with a question on can this cooperation provide spillover benefits to the bilateral relationship? Yeah, I know you, Paul just alluded to that in terms of more export controls coming and so that's complicating matters. Just a quick answer on those two. Why don't you go first, Dennis? I'll go to Paul after that. I, no, I, as you questions. said that question, I kept thinking of Belt and Road. I kept thinking, you know, if China were to uh, utilize his, its uh, leverage in uh, these 60 plus countries across Central Asia and beyond, um, it, it could be a very, very interesting new development trajectory that these countries uh, have. And um, I, I, I've tried to explore some of this. Uh, and while China is building a digital economy and a digital network for communication, et cetera, um, uh, the application of AI still is limited. But I, I can imagine there being something very substantial uh, coming out of this if, in fact, China has its way, particularly since, again, go back to norms and values uh, and standards and things of that sort. Uh, Chinese influence could be uh, very serious uh, uh, and uh, not necessarily in concert with where the United States wants to be if uh, these technologies are uh, easily deployed out in those parts of the world. Uh, Paul, actually, let me come to you with two questions specifically on the military. I, I see the question the, the, in the in the box. Uh, you, you know, we, we've because you, you talked about it gone from zero to 60 and in the military and arms racing, et cetera, et cetera. So two specific questions. Let me direct them to you. And do you think what are the possible areas and limitations that track to dialogue can play in terms of governance, AI governance in the military domain? And let me pair that up with the question is, where does AI, in your view, where does AI fit within the informatization program of the PLA? To what extent is the PLA embracing has or is or has embraced AI? Yeah, those are two, two big questions. Um, yeah, I mean, I think for the dialogue, that, as I said, there's been this really good effort at Brookings over the last two years to talk about the use of AI and things like nuclear command and control. And, you know, I think I have a hard time thinking there should be any disagreement 
that you probably don't want to have a doomsday machine that is using AI to, you know, and sensors and trying to, you know, and as set on automatic. And then if you have something happen, an event happen, you know, we, we have nuclear Armageddon. Nobody wants that. And everybody, everybody can agree sort of on a, on a no doomsday machine scenario. Um, but again, it comes down to sort of the the how do you how do you um, how do you draft this and you know who's negotiating and how do you do this? There shouldn't be any disagreement on that sort of that large that larger um, sort of concept. So there are these concepts um, like you know avoiding uh, having a human in the loop and avoiding having things automated via some sort of AI algorithm um, that, I th that I think that both sides can agree on. But but a lot of this ends up coming down to sort of the the, the nitty gritty of, of of who's who's talking and, and and then what authorities they have and then you know what what how do you get towards an agreement? Those are never easy. I mean they can be done, but they're never easy. Um, in terms of AI use. In, in the military, I mean, we did a study, we worked for a, a large AI company uh, a couple of years ago, we did it and they asked us, they said, well, how are militaries using AI? And um, and at the time, this is now, I guess roughly four years ago, it was pretty, it, it turned out to be pretty mundane. Um, we looked at a large military, not China, but another large military, um, and they were, you know, AI, and again, depending on what you mean by AI, they were using uh, they were using training. They were using some some what could be called AI approaches in training. Um, logistics is another one that comes to mind. I'm sure you know, given that that the um, that uh, for example Alibaba and and its logistics unit, of course they use AI um, uh, as part of their effort to you know route packages and and uh, and set and, and e-commerce kinds of applications. Um, uh, 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 you know, do domestically they're very good. All the all the Chinese companies, JD.com. Uh, Alibaba, all the all the e-commerce companies are using AI as part of their logistics, and so it's not too much of a stretch to think that militaries, which also have logistics uh, uh, challenges, are going to be using AI. The issue of of the uh, of things like generative AI, specifically, for example, that's where I mentioned earlier. I don't, as far as I can tell, no military is using. Um, large language models uh, for some sort of mission critical application. There are these sort of basic uh, issues that, that that you can use those 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 algorithms for. You can use large language models to generate code, for example. They're really good at at doing a first cut at generating uh, 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 you know programming languages like Python. They can generate really good code. You can then go in and tweak it. So there are a lot of sort of applications that you can see militaries or you know companies and then potentially militaries using some of the elements of, uh, of the capabilities of large language models but but in terms of sort of decisive mission critical military applications um I'm just I'm just not seeing it I think that that there, there are these books like this that like, uh, what was the one about the about the the, the the battleships that were all automated and were out there it was it was written by um uh by by um what's his name Peter from um from uh um from um uh American, I know from from the from not from CNAS, but he anyway, he, it was all, it was a ghost fleet. That's what's called ghost fleet, and it was about this future war where both militaries, the Chinese military, are using these automated ships with nobody on board, you know, and that got a lot of attention uh, with the idea that you know that militaries are going to move in that direction. I'm a little skeptical of that. I think that AI is going to be used in these very specific kinds of applications. I don't think it's going to sort of take over and dominate um, uh, the use of military. Uh, military um, weapon systems. Um, we already have a lot of automated and, and systems that use elements of AI, but just other software and sophisticated sensors to do things. Um, so I, I think that you have to get down into the, some of the specifics before you make a statement that you know China's military is going to be AI powered in the future and is going to make, for example, a decisive and AI is going to make a decisive difference in some kind of a conflict. I think that's what we're getting at here because with the, the bigger picture here is that there's an assumption as part of this DC consensus that US and China will come into conflict in the future over Taiwan. And then there's an attempt to work back and say which technologies would be useful there, like AI, right? And then say, okay, well, we have to control them. The problem with that is, as Dennis has mentioned, is that the vast majority of the use of those technologies, for example, um, uh, of AI in general, is not military, right? It's it's alpha fold for doing, you know, for 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 and, and genomics and healthcare and all these areas. A lot of which and, and, and climate science. A lot of these areas where, as you mentioned, to get back to your other question on the global south, you know, there's bigger there are bigger global issues that could mm -hmm. be tackled. By China and U.S. cooperating on climate science, on um, you know pandemic response, healthcare. Um, we have a finding. We have a client, a big healthcare client that's doing using 
federated learning in different markets to train AI algorithms to detect tumors and other, other really critical healthcare things. Well, guess what? Because of all the data issue and the concern about China, China is not part of that, right? Why isn't China part of that effort? Um, well, because of the, of the geopolitical climate and the concern about, you know, uh, genomic data getting in the hands of the Chinese government. So a lot of these really positive uses of AI are being sort of undermined, if you will, by this meme that mil the military and AI is going to be some sort of decisive military capability in the future, which again, I'm, I'm skeptical of, and it means it undercuts the ability of the countries to collaborate on these areas, these big global issues where there should be more collaboration, arguably. Uh, we've hit up against our time limit. We've got to leave it out there. But it's been a fascinating conversation. And I just want to say how good both of y'all were, how important the topic is and how good both of y'all were, Paul and Dennis, that through the first hour, we did not lose even one participant who was there. I mean, they, we held their attention. I think it was a fascinating conversation. I know folks have to get to other places. Today is a busy day, so we're going to wrap up right out here. Uh, Dennis and Paul, once again, thanks very much for your contributions. It's It's been great to have you on board. Thanks Thank for you. hosting. Yes, thanks for hosting this. Thank you. Take care, guys. Bye.